Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to another episode of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. Now, tonight we're trying a different format. We're inviting you to participate with us because it's an open line. You could ask and call in and ask for a, any question or make a contribution. We would like to specifically focus on matters other than labor law. The reason for that is Professor Raja, my co-host, will be covering that. But if we are unable to answer any question, we will take down your details and call you back or get in touch with you some other way in order to assist you. Now, it's very important for you to understand that legal fees are generally very, very expensive. And you now have an opportunity to engage with us on an open line. And perhaps we could be of some assistance to you. Just by way of interest, the law reports are replete with many, many cases emanating from the Constitutional Court. Recently, last week in fact, there was a judgment regarding the rights of workers on, um, on let's say, farmlands or rural areas whose work was terminated. However, they continued to occupy the premises given to them by the employer. Now, this case went all the way to the Constitutional Court. The court held that there was no obligation on the employer to continue providing suitable accommodation to the ex-employees. Now, perhaps you're in a situation where you find that you are either a rural tenant or a tenant in an urban area where a different set of rules apply. There, we, we can speak of the PIE Act, Prevention of Illegal Evictions. And what rights do you as a tenant have and what rights do you as a landlord or lessor have? But in the Constitutional Court, it was made very clear that the city authorities or the city council, in this case, the city council of Cape Town, was obliged to find alternative accommodation if it was within their powers to do so. In fact, in that case, they had moved these residents to Wit Wolverafir, some 30 kilometers away. And that was found to be suitable. So there's always the dynamic in law and the tension between what you consider are your rights and what the law in terms of the Constitution or some other act would afford you. And then there was another decision in the Labour Appeals Court regarding the status of temporary workers or workers that stay on, say, for a period of beyond three months. Now, amazingly, they were held to be permanent employees. So you have all of the rights of a permanent employee. Specifically in this regard, you would have read in the uh, newspapers or heard on the radio the tensions regarding the Uber drivers, specifically in Gauteng, versus meter taxi operators. Interesting question is, Uber is a is an app run business. But in terms of that decision that I've just mentioned, the drivers would then be reckoned to be full-time employees of Uber. So it raises a number of very interesting questions. What are their rights as employees? Can they call on the employer to protect them from strikes? What happens when the employer is unable to fulfill those obligations? What happens when an employee is killed or injured during the course of his employment? As we've heard, they, the one driver that apparently succumbed to his injuries and has died. So there are all of these dynamics. And of course, an area that I'm particularly involved in on a daily basis is that of immigration law. Now, you as an employer 
may be employing various foreigners. Now, last week again, there was a raid in the Johannesburg city centre by multiple task force teams, one of them being Home Affairs. It was reported that approximately 100 people were arrested for being uh, illegal immigrants. But more interestingly, there's now an added obligation on the employer. An employer was fined 20,000 rands for having found to have been employing illegal foreigners. So that could be quite a big responsibility and you must understand your responsibilities as an employer. Now in the field of immigration law, again there was a very interesting constitutional court decision in terms of section 34, the background of, of which is the following. So an ordinary criminal or an ordinary person arrested has to be brought to court within 48 hours in terms of the Criminal Procedure Act. If you are not brought within 48 hours, you must be released. If you are not, then you are uh, taken to be held in unlawful detention and you could have a damages claim. Now that kind of relief was not extended to people that were held for deportation purposes. Now, let me, let me make it clear. There are only certain places that you may be held if you are suspected to be an illegal immigrant. Now, an immigration officer, in terms of Section 34 of the Act, is entitled to arrest you if he's found you to have been illegal and usually they used to hold you for 48 hours and more up to a maximum of 120 days at various holding facilities specifically a place called Lindela in Krugsdorp. However the minister has designated only certain police stations may hold you if you if the charge or suspicion is one of being an illegal immigrant. So you can't be held at an ordinary police station. You have to be taken to a designated one. The theory being that you may not be mixed with ordinary criminals because you haven't been charged with something in terms of the Criminal Procedures Act. It's an immigration infringement. So there are designated areas, minimum of standards of hygiene, etc. Now, in that regard, before I come to the rights of uh, people that were held beyond 48 hours. The court, the Constitutional Court made it very clear that what they'd like to see and gave an order that within 60 days every single person that has been held must appear in court within 48 hours. Now what happens in court? The court can either confirm your detention or it can, or you can be released. So a very, very important development for foreigners held, especially for foreigners held for a very lengthy period while the Home Affairs decides what to do with them. In many cases, foreigners are held because their temporary residence visas were fraudulent or some other document, or alternatively, they were told that their application for asylum seekers permits had been refused or had not been timelessly renewed, or a number of problems that found them to have been incarcerated in Lindela. Now, interestingly, the point that I raised earlier on about you have to be held at a designated police station with minimum standards regarding hygiene, nutrition, etc. The case of Rahim in the Constitutional Court found a number of illegal, well, a number of foreigners were held at various places not designated. So that, that amounted to unlawful detention. And there the Constitutional Court again gave each applicant relief for the number of days they were held. I think up to a, 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 an amount of 10,000 rands was paid to various people depending on the length of time they were held to have been incarcerated at a facility not designated by the minister. 
So as you can see, there's a number of different problems that one can discuss. Perhaps you have a domestic violence issue or you want to know a little bit more about harassment or consumer protection. So there's an invitation for you. If you have an urgent pressing need to see an attorney and you can either not afford one, alternatively cannot travel to see an attorney or you can't get off from work or whatever, let us try and assist you tonight. As I say, this is a pilot project. We are attempting a new format to try and engage with you, our valuable viewers, but we'd like to be of help in any way possible regarding legal issues. And as I've indicated, if I'm unable to answer any particular question, we will revert to you or you'd be able to phone us or email us and we'll try and get you the necessary experts. Now perhaps a, another acrimonious area that one often finds parties really stressing out is that of family law. So that could be anything from a divorce to maintenance to access and, and uh, custody battles. So how does one unpack these issues? What understanding do you have? For example, uh, you would come across a situation where somebody says to you, I'm not giving my spouse access to the children because he doesn't pay maintenance. Now those are very two different issues. The fact that he pays or doesn't pay maintenance doesn't mean that he may or may not have access to the children. It's not an automatic that if you pay maintenance, you can have access and vice versa. What about joint custody? The courts now seem to indicate a leaning towards joint custody. The theory being that the children should not be used as a ping pong ball between the, the parties. I understand we have a caller on the line. Caller, please go ahead. Hello. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Can I ask you to please switch off your television? Oh, it's off, sir. Thank, Thank thanks, you. man. Uh, just, to, just, just give me some ideas in, in terms of the new uh, case that has just passed regarding the issue of a dual employer versus a single employer. Uh, what is the status quo? Because I've just tried to get an understanding from the newspapers. To me, it's understood as if NOMSA is still uh, of the opinion that there's a dual partnership. However, uh, there is a case that's now going to the constitutional court, whether it's a sole employer. Could you just give us some idea on, on, on that issue and what's your view on that matter? Thank you. I'll, I'll listen on. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you for the call. Very interesting question. As I've indicated, labor law is not my forte, nor is it my strongest point. Professor Raja would be able to deal with labor law uh, on another show, but let me try and understand the issue. So when you say dual employer, I mean, the question really is, can I work for company A and at the same time work for company B? A very strange situation because you either have to have your rights with one employer I mean, you can't have it to two. Now, remember, that strange situation was where there was a labor broker, where you really were employed by the company, but they circumvented your relationship with the company and said, no, no, but you don't belong to me. You belong to the labor broker. So they broke your relationship with the company. So if you were in default, you would never be, you would never be able to be disciplined by the company you'd be disciplined by the labor broker and they would get rid of you that way. My understanding about the labor relations, the, the appeal court decision is no. If there's a real relationship between you and the employee, then you can't circumvent that relationship by sta standing behind a labor broker. This is not a definitive answer. You will be able to call into Professor Raja when he hosts the show next week and get a proper answer. If the matter is going to the Constitutional Court, then it is still in abeyance. So there, there might be a judgment. I hope that answers your question. Okay, we have another caller. Caller, please go ahead. Hello. 
Hello. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Ashraf. Wa alaikum salam. What I want to know is uh, in case of a husband dying in an accident and they are not legally married in terms of South African civil law, can the wife claim the insurance, for instance, uh, I mean, she is married, she's got children. What are her rights, for instance, that the husband did not write beneficiary or something? What is her right as far as the insurance policy of the husband that died in an accident? Where she was married Islamically but not registered in court. I'll listen on the radio. Okay. Thank you for your question. A very, very interesting and important question. So there's a number of different sub-questions there. Let's deal with recognition of Islamic marriages. So, historically, Islamic marriages were not recognized. And presently, the Muslim Personal Bill has not yet been passed that would have actually given recognition. But let's talk about how judicial activism has started to recognize Islamic marriages. A number of cases, Kala versus Kala, Ryan versus Edros. The theory being that Islamic marriages were not recognized because they were potentially polygamous. And in the old apartheid Christian era, polygamous unions were frowned upon. However, we live in a constitutional democracy. The judges have been very alive to the fact that Muslims are part of this fabric of society and they have their own marriages and their own ways of termination. So the theory is if the, benef if the marriage is for the benefit of a particular party, that marriage will be recognized, irrespective of the fact whether there was a civil union or not, whether there was a civil marriage certificate or not. That's the first answer. Second question was, what do we do where, in respect of insurance? Now, I believe that you might be referring to the road accident fund and the payment for dependents. I do not think that it is an impediment for the spouse married according to Islamic rights who's lost the breadwinner to be, uh, to be barred from claiming because she'll be claiming for herself and she'll be claiming for her dependents. So RAF matters, road accident fund matters, are matters where, where there was an accident, a motor vehicle collision that led to death or injury. And there are set rules on how and who can claim and in what amounts you could claim. Again, a specialized area of the law but fortunately, the Road Accident Fund now allows claimants to deal directly with the fund. So you really don't need an attorney. And you know, there's matters of contingency fees. You remember the matter of Ronald Bobrov and Son, uh, who were found to have overreached a lot of the, their claimants. And this matter became absolutely messy. But, the, but our courts made it very clear that there is a contingency fee in place and you cannot go over that. You can't say, I'm charging you more than 25% of, of the amount claimed or 100% of my usual fees, taxed and claimed. Whichever is the lesser, you can't actually claim more. So I hope that answers your question as well. I have another call on the line. Please go ahead. I'm sorry, uh, can you uh, please uh, turn down your TV or switch it off? Uh, I'll do so. Yes, go ahead. Listen, uh, can I talk Afrikaans? Yeah, maar, gaan maar aan. Ons praat maar al te al bij talen. Ja, luister hier zo. Ik was zo... Zo so, 22 jaar geleden in een motorongeluk, ne? Ja. En ik heb mijn arm en hals gebrek. Ik kan niet werken. Ik kan niks doen, ne? Ja. En ik heb de procureur gaan zien. En uh, uh, toen zei ze mij, omdat één kaart betrokken is, kan ik een keer uitzien. Het hij gezegd dat er net, net één kaart was, dat jij kan niet eis nie. Ja. Was jij, wat, was jij uh, in elkaar geweest of was jij op die... Ik uh... was in elkaar ongeluk. Ik heb, am, ek het amper vier maanden in ICU geleerd. Ja, mevrouw, maar wat ik wil nou weet, was hij in die kaar geweest? 
Ja, ik was daar. So, jij was niet die bestuurder nie? Nee, ik was niet die bestuurder nie. Ja, je het daarin gerei, nee. Het jy, het jy vir die reid betaal, of was het iemand wat jy geken het? Was het soos een taxi geweest? Nee, het was eindelijk ons het my man weggevat na Kimli toe, want hy het gegaan, as hy was een troep geweest. Hmm, ek verstaan. Mevrouw, dit lijkt voor mij dat 22 jaren nou baie, baie lang is. Daar is een ander wet wat sê, prescription, Je hebt drie jaren om die eis te brengen. Als je niet die eis gebring het in drie jaren, so die eis verval. Maar ek het dit gedoen en toe die prokureur is nou nog weg. Die procureur, jy het die, ge, die, die werk vir hom gegeen en dan het hy niks te doen nie. Ja, toe sê om die een na skaar gewees het, kan hy nie eis te. Ja, mevrouw, dan het jy een eis tegen die procureur gehad, maar dit is ook, dit het ook nou vervallen, want dit, dit was nie binnen drie jare nie. Kom, ek sê vir die wat, wat jy moet nou doen. Jy moet vir die fond skryf, die R, RAF, Road Accident Fund, Skryf vir hulle, sê vir hulle, kyk, jy het nou hierdie type probleem. Het jy nog een eis? Hulle sal dan vir jou kan bloot sê, of jy kan nog uh, aangaan met die eis of nee. Nou, waar is die hospitale records en alles? Hy is het alles. Nou, waar, die procureur, uh, uh, sta, staan hy not, nog in, die, uh, in, sy, uh, in sy praktijk? Hy is verdoen van die aardbol. Uh, mevrouw, dit lijkt voor mij als je nou baie, baie swak saak het, jammer om dit te sê, maar kan je niet net voor die mensen bel bij die RAF? Mhm. Mm Oké. Okay. En dan wil ik nog iets voor haar. Ja, mevrouw. My sien het 20.007 te verongeluk Ja. Maar omdat hy nou gesê dat hy het gebestuur, so daar is ook hier eis in, he? Wel, nee, dit hang af. Nou, vir wie wil hy nou eis? Vir jy self, want die sien het, het hy vir... Uh... Nee, ek praat om hom, dat is vir ons al toe, ja. Ja, jy sien was oorlede? Ja, hy is oorlede, ja. Ja, nou, jy, jy wil nou een saak maak vir, vir geld, want wat hy het vir julle besteen? Ja, hy is om my gewerk. Voor jou gewerk? Maar was, wat hy, het hy vir julle ondersteuning gegeen? Het hy vir julle geld ge ingesamel of gebring? Ja, hy het, ja, hy het die pensum geld, maar die, die probleem is daar, Mees die uh, provoden van nie, het hy vir my 40, vir sy pa 40, en sy sister 20 gelos om te studeer. Wa was daar testament gewees, mevrouw? Daar was nie. Daar was nie. Oké, okay, jylle kan die meeste van die hooggerechtshof nader in jylle distrik. Kom ons sê, dis in die kaap in. Jylle kan hom nou vernader en jylle moet vir hom sê, kyk die kind is nou dood, daar is geld wat daar so le, ons is, uh, ons is net sy familie wat oor is en ons wil, wil van dat geld kry. So, dis in termen van interstate succession. So, die meester van die hooggerechtshof vir die, sal vir, vir jylle die, die eis gee of, of die documenten gee om uit te vul om, om die, om die, uh, om die boedel uh, recht te maak en die geld uit te kry. Nee, jy verstaan verkeerd. Hy het, hy het uh, my veertig uitgebetaal en uh, sy pasen. Maar wie het uitbetaal, mevrouw? Wie het, die, die meester of die pensioen? Wie het nou uitbetaal? Die provident van... Provident, was daar enige ander geld daar? Ja, dat was a, a 20% wat hy van die dokter geloos het. En wat is dan die vraag, mevrouw? Die vrouw daar wat ek mee gepraat het gesê, om my lijf rommeste, is haar kind, 
Mevrouw, ik wil zeggen, je moet nog gauw een procureur gaan zien in die area waar je werkt. Als je niet een procureur kan bekostig nie, daar is universiteiten met legal aid clinics. Alle is gratis, je betaalt niks. Gaan zien iemand daar en dan gee om die hele leer en laat hij net zien wat hij kan doen. Dit is een baie complex in daar. Ja, want ik kan niet verstaan jy pa die 20% om te studeren. Wel, kijk, ik heb niet al die feiten niet, maar ik zal zeggen, je moet dringend bij je procureur uitkomen met, met die hele leer. En als je. Ik was al bij drie, niemand kan me helpen. Wat de aarde is, je mevrouw? Waar blij je? Ik leen te doen in Noordkap. Noordkap. Dat is mijn moeilijk. Oké, okay, mevrouw, dan gaan op die internet. Of gaan zien waar die, uh, was die naaste um, uh, universiteit. En zoals ik zei, alle het procureurs wat gratis werk, gaan net met alle bikkie praat. Oké. Okay. Baie dankie mevrouw voor die oproep. Tot ziens. Dank. Time for an ad break. Please stay tuned and join us after the break with your calls and contributions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the second half of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. And as previously mentioned in the first half, we actually have a new format. We're inviting you to call in on the open line and ask legal questions or make contributions. As I've indicated, if I'm unable to answer a particular question, if it's not in my field of expertise, you will have an opportunity to call back at, an, at the later stage. If it's labor, you can speak to Professor Raja, who's an expert in that field. And if there is something that is really pertinent and I'm unable to answer on the show, you could address an email to me or get hold of me, and then I will try and direct you to the right legal channels. Uh, we have a call on the line. Caller, please go ahead. Hello? Hi, how are you? Uh, well, and you? I'm fine, thanks. I actually want to ask her uh, in the... Yes, I'm okay. Ma'am, can you please switch off your television because we're having feedback here in the, in the studio? Yes, I'm okay. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. The line is clear now. Okay, we have another caller. Please, here's a reminder to all our callers. We'd love to hear from you, but please turn down your television sets because it's uh, enormously disruptive. Okay, I understand that we've lost both the calls. As indicated, the law has a wide variety of topics and it's not possible to cover every single topic. But let us see how we can assist you. Let's go back to some of the understand we have a caller. Please go ahead. Caller, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Do you have a question? Question. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, you can join us again as soon as you, uh, you call, but please switch off your television sets before you call so that we can have a proper discussion with you. As I indicated that there is a huge variety of le legal subjects, recently you would have seen that the KwaZulu-Natal Health Department was being sued for not giving proper oncologist treatment. Now, you'd also have noticed that a number of hospitals no longer offer gynecological treatment or services because of the high number of actions being brought against doctors and obstetricians and gynecologists specifically. 
So medical negligent cases are now on the rise. And again, here the minister, Aaron Matsaledi, called upon what he was saying, a cabal of errant uh, lawyers, uh, not to take advantage of the situation, which, which um, was met with resistance by the law societies because the idea to blame the lawyers for, for trying to represent to try and represent uh, legal interests of affected persons is not proper. But we have two callers. Please go ahead. Caller number one. Yes, okay. Yes, go ahead, ma'am. Uh, Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, I just want to ask you a question. Yes. I was accident five years ago, uh, five years, and I said I must go for operation, for the operation, and I refused to take operation. But they never paid me out to stay here. I just want to know what was I Okay, let me just understand your question. You hurt your knee at work five years ago. My neck. Your what? My neck. Your head. My head and my neck. At while you were at work? No, no. I was in a farm. You were you were working you were in a farm? No, no. I was in a car. Oh, I you were in a car. You got injured in a motor vehicle accident. Yes. Five years ago. Yes. You didn't do anything in the first three years. I that, phoned them and I sent letters and stuff in. But every time I phoned them and I don't hear nothing from them again. Okay. Now, road accident fund employees have been uh, deployed around the country specifically at hospitals. There you could encounter an employee, approach one of them, file your claim, let's see if they are still going to entertain it or not. Sometimes uh, prescription works very strangely. Sometimes you might find that your claim is still alive. So the Prescription Act, for example, says you have three years in which to bring in a claim. But you remember in the Constitutional Court decision of the Vodacom matter against the gentleman who says that he's, he was the creator of the Please Call Me, the court said that prescription in the classical sense didn't apply, and they entertained his claim even after three years. So there's an example of what could really happen in court. But there is help out there. Go to one of the uh, universities or alternatively the clinics. There are now road accident fund agents at these uh, places that you could engage with. I hope that answers your question. We have another caller. Okay, just to continue. So the Constitutional Court is the highest court uh, in our country. And if the Constitutional Court pronounces on a particular matter, that is the last port of call. You can't really go beyond the Constitutional Court and sue in another jurisdiction. Having said that, it is of interest to note that a number of foreign courts are now entertaining claims by citizens. I think we have a caller. Caller, please go ahead. So let's say, for example, recently there was the, a claim by some of the political parties that they will be laying charges with foreign governments or foreign agencies because some of the documents were dollar denominated. I mean, that's far, far beyond the jurisdiction of any court. You'd recall that the FBI got involved in the saga of FIFA based on the fact that the contract was denominated in dollars and the Americans said, we have jurisdiction over that, we will prosecute. And so you saw a number of prosecutions against FIFA officials uh, in foreign jurisdictions because the contract was, uh, was costed out in dollars. Alternatively, you could have various companies operating in foreign jurisdictions and also operating in the United States. And then the US government will say, um, the charge against you is that you were involved in bribery and corruption. We're now going to take action against you in terms of our domestic legislation. 
Very, very interesting developments there. It's time for our final break. Please stay tuned and join us after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You're tuned to Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. Tonight we have a new format. We have an open line. The open line, you are invited to call in, make contributions or ask questions, which we'll try and address to the best of, I would try and address to the best of my ability. I do not profess to be an expert in every area of the law. However, my area of law is immigration and you could call in regarding anything, regarding your permit, your asylum seekers permit, your temporary residence visa, perhaps your illegal, what, what uh, recourse would you have? We have a call on the line. Caller, please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, look, my, my name is Mr. Khan. Yes, Mr. Khan. I, I'm phoning for this uh, legal advice on the TV. Yes, Mr. Khan. Uh, can, can I speak to you about it? Yes, please go ahead, yeah. Uh, look, I, I've got... I've got... Uh, so, some documents, some uh, papers uh, that are about, uh, about 20 to 30 years old. It, it is a land, a piece of land in, uh, in Natal. Uh, the title of this, of which it was held by my father, late father. Hello? Yes, I'm here, Mr. Khan. I'm listening to you. Now, I've got those papers and they're about 30 years old, you know? Is this a land uh, claims, Mr. Khan? Do you intend yeah, to claim? Yeah, it's something like a land claim. Okay. And now, I am, I am the only son that is left, you know, there were four, I had four brothers. And, and their names are mentioned in, in that uh, will, you know, uh, in those documents. Okay. But now they all have passed away and I'm the only one that is left. And, and I am 87 years old. So I just wanted to know whether there is any chance of me to claim on this uh, land, you know. Yes, Mr. Khan. So land claims had closed some time ago. However, mm. recently there's been an effort to reopen the, the claims on land and give people an opportunity to further file claims for their land. Now, if mm. that land was removed unlawfully or without due and proper compensation by the apartheid government, that is a land claims that you can go and reopen and file a claim to say, I want, to, I want proper compensation. Now, if there are four people mentioned in the title deed, I think what you're trying to say is three, per, three brothers have passed on and you are left. What will happen to the three brothers' shares? Do they have children or do they have... Yes, they, yes, they have children, yes. Okay, now, le, now you see their estates would have been wound up, okay? And yeah. their heirs would have received whatever was due to them in terms of the estate, either interstate or in terms of the will. Now, these, these are new claims accruing to those estates. So one goes back to the master and say, I'd like the claim that is due to each of the heirs of my late brother to be redistributed to them. Let's say your, 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 your land is now uh, uh, sold for a million rand and you would get, I'm just giving an example, 25% and the brothers would have got 25%, but they don't have, they're obviously not here their spouses and children have already inherited through their old estates. Those estates have to be redistributed. So if there's a claim coming in now after a long time, you go back to the master because some of those children would have also passed on. So the master has a formula to work out who would get what. The master mm -hmm. of the high court, uh, I think in, in, in Natal, in, in, in Johannesburg, it's here in Marshall Street, uh, each one each jurisdiction has its own master, and you can approach the master, you can look for the details uh, on the internet, get an address and go and see the master of the high court. Of course, after, after you've brought an application within the land claims in your division that you live, 
the land claims authority or the land claims court. You file a claim on behalf of yourself and uh, your deceased brothers. I see, I see. Oh, okay, well, don't, thank don't you very much. Don't leave it too long, Mr. Khan, because there is another window of opportunity opening and I don't think there'll be another one after this. Oh, I see. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> we have another caller. Caller, please go ahead. Hi, how are you? Well, and you? I'm good, thanks. I, I actually wanted to ask the date of a... I'm married to my husband, uh, Islamically. Ma'am, you have to switch off your television. I'm sorry. I can actually hear feedback here. You're married to your husband by Islamic law, yes? Yes, we have children. Yes. He is a foreigner from Pakistan. Yes. And what if was was uh, on Aslam, and then they said it gave uh, sex based leave of country. So when he told her, we, he went to me and him, and then they said they can't do anything they have. Sorry, uh, ma'am, I can't hear you. You have, I, I, I please ask you to switch off your TV. I cannot hear your oh, question. Okay, okay oh. so, you, so you have, you're a South African citizen. You're married to a foreigner. Yes. Okay. Now, your husband was an asylum-seeking permit, Section 22. Yes. Right. And then? And then they gave him a sex day leave of country. They gave him what? Sex day leave of country. They said he should leave the country within 30 days. Oh, th so and they rejected the asylum seeker's application and but they said that he must leave the country. Yes, and he went to renew it. He went to renew that? He went to renew the asylum. And then they gave a Yes. In the now, in there, he would have a right of appeal. If he disagrees with the decision of the refugee status determining officer or the person who said to him, your asylum seeker's permit is rejected, they have to give reasons. It's either manifestly unfounded or unfounded. There is a built-in mechanism, a right to appeal against that decision, first to the standing committee, and if it was the standing committee who, may, who gave that decision, then you have a second step, step of appeal to the appeals, Refugee Appeals Commission. And ultimately, if you still disagree with that decision, you can ask for a judicial review of that decision. Now, that decision that they gave you has to be well motivated. They have to give reasons. And you are able to challenge those in terms of what we call PAJA, it is uh, the promotion of administrative justice act so so it's a very it's a very important act and public officials have to act and make decisions in terms of that act so if it's judicially unsound for whatever reason you really need to seek uh, professional advice because lawyers will understand whether the whether the decision was was procedurally unfair or substantively unfair or unjust and then engage with the authorities on your behalf and say, we want this thing reviewed. Okay, so the problem is we don't know where to go, what to do, where to start. Where, where, what area do you live in? We are in Cape and Cape Town. Uh, I'm sorry, in Cape Town? In K it's KZN. Oh, K KZN, yes. yes. So, if you look on the internet, there is a standing committee for refugee affairs, but your letter of rejection should give you your rights and it should say to you, you have the right to appeal against this decision or file a review within 10 or 14 days. Does that, that notice not say so? It says so. Right. Mm -hmm. That is what you should act on. You should say why the decision of that person who made the decision is unlawful and unjust or illogical, all in terms of PAJA, Promotion of Administrative Justice Act. Now let's say you have no idea what to do. I would urgently ask you to call Lawyers for Human Rights or the Legal Resources Center in your area. 
LHR, look it up, Lawyers for Human Rights, they usually take on these cases where the department might have acted unlawfully. But you definitely Lawyers. need professional help. Okay, Lawyers for Human Rights. And the Legal Resource Center, and also go off to the two universities that have clinics in KZN. I think it might be Westville. I'm not sure which universities are there. But usually every university that teaches law has a legal aid clinic. And there you would find lawyers as well as students that might be willing to take up your case. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so just to come back to an area of focus that is quite important, um, a lot of foreigners would find that the Department of Labor does not approve a general work visa. Uh, and the employer has to go through a rigorous compliance process to try and convince the Department of Labor that this particular employee is very important for him. So the Department of Home Affairs will not approve a visa without the letter of recommendation from the Department of Labor. As I say, it's quite rigorous. I never come across a situation where the Department of Labor is quite happy to say to the employer, yes, we recommend the employment. Um, we have a caller. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello. How are you? Well, and you? All Thank right, hold on one second. Hello. Hello, Hello yes. Hello. Yes. This is Munsipa speaking. Yes. Um, I have a problem with my ID. Yes, what, what is the problem? Please, ma'am, I, I, I can hear you. Please switch off your television because I can hear you in the studio again. Okay, you have a problem with your ID. What's the problem? I can, I, I can. Have a, I have applied for my ID. Yes. But um, when when I go there, they tell me that I cannot get an ID smart card. And then I emailed to them, and they said that I can only get the green ID book. But whenever I go to Home Affairs, they don't uh, take my application. Now, why don't they take the application? What what seems to be the problem? They say. Um, I think, um, you know, I can't hear you, ma'am. Hello? Yes. Are you, are you a South African citizen by birth? Yes, I was born here. Right. Now, you've applied for a identity document, but you tried as, um, you tried the first the smart card ID. Yes, and they say that um, because my parents weren't born here. Your parents are naturalized South African citizens? Only my father, not my mother. Your mother is a South African citizen by birth? No, my father, my, both my parents are not born here, but they have the South African citizen. Yes, they, they are citizens by naturalization. That means they would have gone through some process. They came as foreigners. They. They would have worked here alternatively. Their parents were South... So they became naturalized South African citizens. Yes, my father only, not my mother. So your mother is still on a foreign... is still a foreigner? My mother has a non-SA ID. Yeah, so she's on permanent residence. Yes. Okay. Now, you were born here when? In 1999. And what was the status of your parents in 1999? Um, in 1999, they did not have any documents. I think they only had a refugee. Okay, so here's, here's how it works, right? You can okay. be a citizen by birth if at the time of your birth, one or both of your parents were South African citizens or at that time permanent residence permit holders. It appears that you would have gone along the line of your father or and your mother in order to obtain permanent residence. Now, until recently, 
you could have qualified for citizenship if one or both of your parents were citizens or permanent residents, permit holders. So they've actually changed the law now. So what they saying, to, what you're actually saying is, I wish to claim citizenship or, or my ID on the basis of my father being a citizen. And are you over the age of 18? No, I'm still 17. You're still 17. Okay, so what they're saying is, you're not yet a citizen. That's why they want to only issue with a, you with the green ID, non-citizen ID. I think that's what the department is saying. Okay. Go and I, see. Uh, I do have a birth certificate. Yes. You were born here at the time that neither your parents were citizens or permanent residence permit holders. Okay. So being born in the country at the time where the parents didn't have rights does not extend rights of citizenship to yourself. Hence, I'm saying I understand the facts that uh, without actually looking at any documents, that the Home Affairs is saying you're not a citizen by birth, you are still a permanent residence permit holder. Did you have a citizenship application on your, made on your behalf? No. Okay, so if your father is a citizen and you're a minor child, you can actually apply for citizenship. That is the first step before you apply for an ID document. Okay. So please go to the Department of Home Affairs Civic section, apply for your citizenship based on the fact that your father is a citizen and you're a minor. Okay, but is this only uh, applicable after I turn 18? No, no, before. Once you okay. turn 18, they'll expect you to, to pursue your own roots. Then you're a, you're a major in the eyes of the law. So do it while you're 17. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you for you so your much. call. Time for a short ad break. Please stay tuned and join us after the break. Join the conversation. Like us on Facebook, ITV Networks. Follow us on Twitter, at ITV underscore SA. Keep up to date with all the programming and subscribe to our YouTube channel, ITV Networks. Win two silver tickets to the Muslim Lifestyle Fest 2017 by simply answering this question. Name two guest speakers at the Marriage Conference 2017. SMS the word MLF and your answer to 43366. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You are tuned to Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. In terms of our new format, which we're trying out tonight, we've had an open line. We've had many, many interesting calls. You are still invited to join us with your comments or calls in the last few minutes of the show. An area of expertise that I enjoy uh, every day is that of immigration law. And there are many, many complex areas within that. So there is a category of foreign worker that falls under a very specialized area known as critical skills. The theory is South Africa lacks critical skills. There are about 380 definite critical skills. Amazingly, under a category of agriculture, a critical skills shortage is experienced for sheep shearers. If you are a sheep shearer anywhere in the world and you wish to come and work in South Africa, you will qualify for a critical skills visa. Of course, there's the normal requirements for engineers, especially in the area of aeronauticals. Uh, South Africa has got a, um, a niche in the, in the area of the SKA and um, they are looking for people with those skills. I believe we have a call on the line. The critical skills, as I've said, extends to various areas. One of the critical skills is in, the, in respect of software engineers. But amazingly, because South Africa uh, has this SKA in Sutherland, and it's part of the worldwide network of astronomers, etc., there's a huge critical skills shortage in that area. Very interestingly, 
In the last 24 hours, there was a report from South America of a particular noise emanating from a star in the galaxy. Now imagine if you were this critical skilled worker that was monitoring uh, in Sutherland uh, signals from space and suddenly there was some activity on the radio. A very huge boost for your um, career, I would say. So South Africa lacks these critical skills, engineering skills are required, actuarial skills are required. There's so many fitters and turners and you are invited to actually have a look at how you could contribute to the various industries uh, in South Africa. There is going to be a building boom in respect of power stations, uh, also nuclear power stations, so you could look at various critical skills that you may want to contribute uh, that will allow you to live and work in South Africa. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I have to say I've really enjoyed the show tonight and thank you for your participation. Without you, the show would have been very difficult to continue. It is heartening to see that so many people have taken advantage and have called in. We'll try and repeat this. If you still have questions, I hope you've taken down our details to try and contact us. But thank you once again for having joined us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.